Welcome to Tuesday evening on Raconteurs News. We've had a wonderful blue sky day after all the chemtrails cleared here. And uh, it's, it's getting a bit nippy, it's getting towards winter, but uh, feeling pretty good. I had some uh, interesting experiences the last few days. And how are you, Jason? You know, I'm uh, I'm sat here and I'm waiting. Uh, we've, we've got um, killer clowns all over the place running about amok. We've got an insane billionaire madman who's going to take over the world. He's running for president. I'm just waiting for Batman to turn up. Yeah, and clowns. Isn't it just an advert for the remake of the Stephen King film, It? Well, you see, it, it happens every year. I don't know what it is, why people are so surprised. It happened a couple of years ago. It used to. It happened that time when we had some really um, heavy snow. Um, it happens bef- around about Halloween time. I think it probably is that... Mm. Um, but it does happen every single year, doesn't it? Every single year. I don't. I don't. I don't get it. I'm not scared of clowns. They well, it, it, as far it, as I'm concerned, clowns are about as scary as the fact that this winter is going to be the coldest winter ever. Because we get that every year at this time of year as well, don't we? Yeah, it's it's going to be the coldest winter ever. The snow's going to be the whitest snow that there's ever been. It's going to be so white that we won't even see it. Oh wow. Yeah. I, I, oh, I'm telling you, this is the the whole things. The old kitten caboodle's coming down. It, it's it's just going to be nuclear bombs and oh, all yeah. s- threats and all sorts of uh, uh, winter stuff coming along. So, I, I don't know, it's about. To, I think we should hold tight between now and 2017. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Anyway, tonight we've got a great guest on. Um, we we. Well, you weren't on the show with Anthony Carlin, but um, we got a massive response with the messages there. And this particular gentleman was uh, sending quite a few messages in and uh, contributing to that show. Then at the end of the show, he called me up and uh, asked if he could come on and talk about his case. And uh, after the chat I had with him, I couldn't refuse. He's um, a guy with um, great breadth and depth of knowledge, um, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to speaking to him tonight. Welcome to Raconteurs News, Dave Javu. Dave Javu. Hey Good then. evening, Dave Javu. You sat, your, your name sounds familiar. I'm sure I've heard it before. Hello. Sorry about that. My mic was stuck on mute. Uh, <laughs> no worries, mate. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate the intro. You're more than welcome. So, yeah, would you like to uh, start off, Dave, by telling the listeners a little bit about uh, what got you started on this path and um, how you came to be in the position you're in today? Well, um, my path started when I was quite young. Um, I I used to uh, drive with a van driver for my dad's firm, and one of his... Uh, brothers used to know about things like the birth certificate being a bond and and me and the van driver used to talk about it and I was only young then but um, ultimately it piqued my interest and along the way um, I've kind of learnt off of several other people including a fairly highly well a a very highly qualified contract manager that I worked with for a while who taught me a few things as well Um, and Basically, the story I want to bring on to tonight is is about the mortgage dispute I've had with the bank, um, which started off uh, in 2007 uh, when I uh, approached, well, the broker approached me, said, do you want to remortgage? And I said, yes, uh, I'm looking for a tracker mortgage, because at the time, there was quite a few um, uh, finance men on the internet that were saying that the system was going to come down and it was all a Ponzi scheme and this, that and the other. And this was something I'd drawn my own conclusion to. Um, And so I thought, right, I'll ask for a tracker mortgage. And so basically, the uh, broker got me a tracker mortgage. But Listen, Dave, sorry, Dave, um, I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. First of all, can we have a little background? Who are you? How old, you know, sort of give us some, I don't need to know how old, exactly how old you are, but, you know, what sort of age you are, what you do for a living, what, you know, are you married, that sort of thing. Give us a bit of background first, please. All right. Um, Yeah, well, I'm I'm, I'm in my mid-40s. I'm a single guy. I've been a carpenter and joiner. Uh, most of my life for a trade, fully trained and qualified. 
Uh, then I, I've worked in the office for the firm. I've, I've worked with every trade along the way, from ground workers, van drivers, right through to the architects and contract managers. Um, on top of that, uh, where do we go? doing what sort of thing? When you say you work with them, what what, what sort of thing were you doing? Uh, building. Um, we'll, we'll build. Started off small in the early days. We were doing um, extensions, and it expanded. At one point, we were doing forty bed nursing homes, um, and then uh, we doubled the size of a hotel in one job, um, and eventually we ended up doing properties, uh, just uh, buying plots, uh, redeveloping them, selling them on, and then moving on to the next plot. Is this your own company, or are you no? This 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 was my family's, uh, my father's firm. So um, I, I just got lucky, really, because I could uh, work with him as and when he had work, and when he didn't have work. I can I relate to that, believe me. <laughs> yeah, delved, delved into other things. Uh, I did a lot of sales, and I learned all about neuro linguistic programming from sales and the way they did marketing and psychology all bund bundled together. Um, so along the way, a lot of my experiences have led me to be to, to who I am today. Um, and then the la the job that I had when I was when I took out the mortgage, I was a lecturer. I, I, I saw that the crash was coming, and I thought, right, I, I'll apply for a job as a lecturer because it was more stable. Okay. So I worked for a college as a lecturer for a while. Do we lecturing uh, in what? Sorry. Carpentry and joinery. Okay, great. So I did that. Uh, unfortunately, that made me ill. And I, I, I had a bit of a breakdown, and I ended up uh, being diagnosed with uh, depression and bipolar. Um, and are, you, are you single, Dave? I am, yeah. Yeah, you are, okay. Sorry, I, I, I know not, you said that. You're not earlier, asking me you? for a date here. Uh, well, <laughs> do, do you know, I, I would, but I've got no way to take you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've got this feeling that we've been out before as well. I don't know where it comes from, but anyway, you carry on. Sorry, Dave. Uh, me Sorry, interrupting. Um, yeah. So yeah. So I was a lecturer, and I was on, earning good money. Uh, then the bureaucracy and the pressure from that job. Um, I, I was not ready for it. I'd spent twenty odd years on the building sites, uh, where there was very little bureaucracy. That was all done by the office staff, and I was a practical guy. So that just made me ill. Um, made me sick. Uh, eventually, um, I was ahead on my mortgage at the time, and I ended up uh, signing on to the sick, seeing a doctor, and I was prescribed lots of tablets because the, the problem wasn't getting worse. I was having more panic attacks. Um, and it's from a guy who's been, I mean, I've been a martial artist as well in my life, a, a Muay Thai fighter. I used to fight in the ring. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd take on all comers at, in my heyday, and I was a very confident guy. So to end up in this position where I'd lost all my confidence, and I, I'm still trying to bring it back now, to be fair, um, it, it, you, you, once you've lost it, you don't realise what you had in the first place until you've lost it. That that was my, my realisation. Um, and I just felt like, uh, at the time, that there wasn't much worth living for, and I had to go to the doctor's, ended up on loads of different tablets, and some of them did more damage than what I was already struggling with, if I'm truthful. Um, but I had to try. And whilst all this was going on, my mortgage that I took out in 2007, um, when the crash happened, my payments dropped by £140. And I was working at the college at that time, and I walked in to the uh, office one day, and everybody was a big buzz around the offices, and it was all doom and gloom. I said, what's going on? And they said... The stock market's crashed. The, everything's crashed. The finances crashed. And they're all talking about what they'd lost and this, that and the other. And I actually did a bit of a whoop. I said, thank God for that because now my mortgage is going to go down mm -hmm. because I knew that the remedy would have to be lower interest rates. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, they'd, they'd end up with half the country on the streets. So it, it, I was quite pleased at that. Um, but anyway, another six months later and I was out of that job and not so pleased. Um, and... I ended up getting a letter from the bank uh, that basically was telling me that my two-year tracker was coming to an end and my mortgage payments were going to basically go up by 160, 170 quid. Um, and so, so can you explain to so you had a tracker mortgage. Can you explain to us in layman terms, you know, just quickly, simply what a tracker mortgage is? Well, a tracker mortgage follows, follows the, um, the, the interest rate, basically. The base uh, rate? Yeah, basically, yeah. As that changes, your, your 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 mortgage could go up and it could go down. Now, at one point, 
mine was my mortgage whilst I was in the job was was going up and up and up into four hundred quid, about four hundred and forty, if I believe, if I'm rendering correctly. Um, and I was thinking to myself, if this don't crash soon, I'm going to regret having this tracker mortgage because I could end up paying five, six, seven hundred pound if the rate had carried on climbing. Um, you'd have, it would have been in up shit creek without a paddle, excuse the language. But um, ultimately, it did crash, and my my, my uh, educated guess paid off, and it plummeted. It came down uh, by 140, 150 quid. So, as I, like I said, I was happier with that, and that I was still paying more than the mortgage, and so I was getting into advances. Ended up with a letter from them saying that we're going to up your mortgage and your two-rate track has finished. Uh, and I, I phoned them up and I said, what's going on? I said, I'm on a tracker mortgage. And they said, no, you're on a two-year tracker. I said, that can't be right because I asked for a tracker mortgage and I didn't realise that we were going to be a two-year special rate tracker. Um, so they said, no, you're going back onto a repayment mortgage now and it's going to be £350-odd a month. Well... In the meantime, I'd been on benefits and I had a welfare rights officer got me everything that I was entitled to and that was doing well. But what what happened is when the Tories took over, um, they stopped slashing benefits and the interest was cut on mortgages. So by, by default, they tend to be setting you up to fail because you're not pay, they're not paying off enough towards your mortgage. You've got to pay for it out of your, your, your what you're supposed to be able to live on. Um, and that leaves you with very little for anything else. Not yeah, even- I, I think when you're on benefits, it used to be anyway that they pay the interest <laughs> on your mortgage, wouldn't they? Um, yeah, they pay it all at one point, all your interest, and and uh, and you'd just have to make up about fifty or sixty quid or something like that. But it changed dramatically. Um, uh, sorry, I, I just want to I, I just want to get a, a, this picture. We're trying to paint a picture for uh, people listening. Um, yeah, what- uh, geographically, where whereabouts are, are we talking? Where you were, just to give some idea. We're in the Midlands. In the Midlands, right? Okay. Yeah, UK. So, so yeah, I'm 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 basically struggling at this point, and I'm speaking to this woman, and I've I've notified them that um, I'm now uh, diagnosed with depression and bipolar, and the circumstances have all changed, and. She uh, and I said, "Is there anything you can do for me?" I said, "Because I've, I know there's a track of products that you're doing right now. Can you not switch me on to that?" And they refused that. And then I made another suggestion, and they refused that. And if the only thing they'd come round to uh, was putting me on interest on holiday payments. So I said, "Look, I'm not really happy with this, but I'm not very well, and, and I've I've got more more to be doing, if you like, like I recovering." Than fight this, so I'll put up with that for now. But I'll have to come back later and question you on it because, as far as I'm concerned, you should be putting me on a rate that I can afford, and you're not doing. So that was left a few days, and then I started getting phone calls from the bank's research department, and these these characters uh, started saying, "We're concerned that you're on interest only." And I says, "Well, what do you propose to do about it? You put me on it." Um, and what you, you won't offer me anything else, so what is there left to do? And they wouldn't, still wouldn't do anything, but they were just showing their concerns. And then another guy called and started accusing me again from the bank's research department, started to try and say filed a, a fraudulent mortgage claim, um, not claim, application. And I said, no, I haven't. I said, I've had very little to do with the paperwork. I said, it was all done by brokers. So... How, how do you work that out? I says, I'm on good money. I'm earning at a, at a college and blah, blah, blah. And he tried to explain how, how I shouldn't have got that product. And I said, so basically, but he was also trying to scare me to death. Now, bear in mind, I'm diagnosed with depression and bipolar at this point. Mm-hmm. And, and now I'm not suicidal, but I can imagine a lot of people with depression and bipolar get there. And I could totally empathize with them feeling uh, that way. I've definitely thought about the empathy side of it. I, I, no wonder people feel suicidal in this position because everything you try and do just gets blocked by some idiot in a suit waving a pen around. Um, so I, I was I was a bit like shocked that he was he was prepared to try and bully me uh, by basically accusing me of fraud. And I just thought, oh, if I don't get stuck into this and learn what's gone on, um, I'm going to be in trouble here. So I said to him, um, 
you're telling me that the product was missold, basically. I said, it's not a case of fraud. I said, if I shouldn't have been put on this product, it's a mis-selling issue. And that shut him up. All of a sudden, he backed off and he ended up putting the phone down. Then a couple of days after that, another guy called me and started to tell me the terms and conditions and if I don't keep up repayments, blah, blah, blah. So at this point, what I'd done is I'd instigated the official offer. I cancelled. I revoked their direct debit privileges uh, in writing and they had to stop taking the direct debits. And I set up a standing order. So now they're getting some from a standing order from me and some from the DWP. Mm -hmm. So... They're being paid, and but I basically wrote this official offer saying this is what I can afford right now, and they accepted it. I carried on paying it. That was okay for quite a while. And about 18 months, maybe a bit longer, after the initial uh, switching to interest only, I thought I'd better start writing to people about this being on interest only because otherwise they'll just try and forget about it. So I wrote them a letter saying, uh, I don't think I should have been put on interest only. I think you should have uh, given me a product, because I took financial advice at that point. And they said, no, 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 uh, you, you, you told us you were made redundant. We never had any obligation to put you on any uh, other product. We've got no duty of care towards you, uh, blah, 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 which I found astounding. It's, a, um, it's absolute nonsense, isn't it? Which lender is this, uh, Dave? I don't want to say, mate, because it's okay, not... OK, fair enough. Minutes, ...so um, I, I'm, I might be doing myself an injustice by talking about it openly, but um, right now, I just think it's the right time to, to try and tell people uh, how I've managed to deal with it. But um, ultimately, they they were having a right old go at me, trying to trying to beat me down. It, 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 I call it gaslighting. They use this tactic where no matter what you say, even if you've read it off their own website and you read it back at them, they try and tell you that blue's black and you're not reading it right. You've misinterpreted it or something. And, and they just completely stonewall pretty much everything you say to them. And I'd said at this point, I said, I want to see the contract, the original signed documentation, because as far as I'm concerned... Uh, I don't recall it saying on there that it was a two-year tracker rate mortgage. I want to establish whether you're lying or whether somebody's made a mistake at the brokerage because I didn't ask for a two-year tracker. But they wouldn't come up with this documentation. They wouldn't arrange for a meeting to go in and see it, which I found suspicious. So I ended up down Citizen's Advice and I got this woman. I said, look, I'm after two things. I want a phone call that proves that I told them that I wasn't made redundant. And I want a, uh, a a copy of the contract. So she's phoned them up on my behalf. And she was quite a good lady. She was quite auspicious. And she said, right, we're after this contract. You need to send it and make sure you do it within seven days. And they were like stuttering on the phone. I could hear them. Um, and she, they tried to tell her something. She says, that's not good enough, is it? She says, you need to send the originals and, and let us see them. Uh, or at least copies. And it was just went on like that. So I was like, excellent. Um, so I thought I was going to get somewhere at this. And then she turned, I said to her, I says, is it likely that they will change the terms and conditions? And she says, oh, yes. She says, we had a, a man who was on a dialysis machine in his 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And he, he was basically in a coma. And his son noticed that his bank details, his bank um, uh, loan had actually doubled. But he knew his dad couldn't have done anything about it because... Uh, he was in a coma. It wasn't him that's authorised it. So he took that citizen's advice and they ended up getting into the loan and got them to produce the original documentation. And sure enough, uh, they had doubled his payments and their excuse was, we thought he was dying. So once she told me that, I was sitting there thinking, right, OK, so there is a, a fairly good chance that because I've told them that I'm ill, uh, they're now trying to take advantage of me knowing that I won't be fit and able to defend myself. Or, uh, sorry, or, sorry. I, 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 that just astounds me. Um, it, it astounded me at the time. It, so it's, let's just recap on that. They doubled uh, his payments um, yeah. and doubled his, his loan yeah. without <laughs> any authorization whatsoever... And no. they said that, that that was because they thought he was dying. Yeah, that was their excuse. They thought he was dying. 
so and that's, if and that's pretty much word for word. Dying, you, you, you can commit any sort of fraud or any criminal act against them just because you thought they were dying. Is that is is that what they were saying? Oh, it's that's they, ridiculous. Yeah, well, but that that was their excuse. They they thought he was dying, um, and that was pretty much word for word what I was told by Citizens Advice Lady. So. I was thinking then, well, we've got to persist and try and get to see this documentation. So we waited for a while and nothing turned up. So I then uh, said, I'm going to take it to the Ombudsman now. Um, the first time I went to the Ombudsman, I was more after the phone call to prove that I'd not said that I was made redundant. Um, so I went after this phone call. No, sorry, I, I went after the contract first. Uh, the phone call comes second. but So I went through the ombudsman process and asking uh, another lady who was an ex-bank manager from Citizens Advice, uh, wrote me a brilliant letter asking for things I'd never even heard of, the deed of assignment I'd not even heard of back then, uh, asking for a deed of assignment and uh, the original documentation and blah, blah, blah. So she wrote me a brilliant letter. It went to the ombudsman. The, the complaint started um, and... What they did is, because I was a bit naive to the ombudsman process, uh, they got a, a, an adjudicator to talk to me, but she basically, I thought she was the ombudsman, because there's two people. that You get a telephone staff adjudicator, and then if you insist, it then goes to an ombudsman. But I didn't realise you had to insist. I thought you were already talking to the ombudsman. It's a bit of, bit of trickery, because it wasn't so easy to work out. Yeah. Um, and so this is the first time I've used the ombudsman and, and they basically wrote, the bank wrote and said, had sent evidence of a direct debit uh, guarantee uh, uh, that was, uh, sorry, a direct debit agreement and an insurance agreement. So I said to this woman at the ombudsman, I said, surely you can't take that as the contract. So well, that's proof of contract and that's what we've got to accept. And I was like, well, but that's not the contract. I said, the contract's the original documentation. I said, so they've just provided evidence that there was a contract, which I don't dispute anything. What I want to see is the original documentation. And so, that you can, you can, so that you can then examine that for the terms and conditions, which uh, w would have put you into the situation that you found yourself in. Yeah, well, at this point, I'd never even seen the terms and conditions as well. So that that's uh, uh, another thing that under contract law, you've got to be shown them before you sign the bloody thing. And I've never seen them. So uh, not until this, this uh, at least last year, I, I, I first saw them or it might have even been this year. Um, but ultimately, I, I'm, I'm now in a situation with the ombudsman where if I'd have known better, I'd have said, uh, well, I wish for you to forward this to the ombudsman instead of taking her word for it, who was just an adjudicator, and letting it go. Um, so I went back to the bank writing a letter saying I'm now going to have to seek legal advice. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm now going after a phone call that you, you, you failed to supply. I'd asked for that verbally. I got citizens' advice to ask for it. I ended up getting the ombudsman to ask for it. Um, so we're at the ombudsman again a few months later, and I'm saying to this woman, you need to get me this phone call because they're refusing to give it me. And she, OK, I'll ask for it. So she sent a, uh, an email request only for about seven days later. She turned around and, and said, uh, uh, we haven't got it. They, they, they can't produce it because it's no longer on the records. And I said, but trust, it proves a point. Um, it proves that I'm not lying, and uh, I told them the circumstances right from the beginning, which they're trying to hide. And then she turned around, she said, well, even if I did have it, I wouldn't give it to you. And I was mm -hmm. like, you what? That's my fucking property. I said, if you've it does, got it... It belongs to you, it pertains to you, so it's your, it is your property. Of course it is, you know, so I, I couldn't believe what she was saying. And obviously, that disheartened me, because I'm still ill at this point, I'm trying to do all this with depression... Polar, I'm being on some heavy duty meds that most of the time were leaving you in, in, unable to think, let alone uh, construct a sentence and an argument to these people. So I was really struggling and, and I just sort of lost a bit of heart then. And I left it for a few months. And uh, then I thought, I'll have one more go to try and stop this going to this. Because they kept sending me these letters saying that it's going to go up, it's going to go up, it's going to go up. And eventually I spoke to this girl. Um, and I phoned, it was like the Saturday staff are different to the week staff, and I phoned on a Saturday on purpose because I thought maybe she won't be in the loop because it seems to me like there's a loop of staff, all, I'm in a battle of wits with several of them, not just one, 
There's several of them all covering each other's backside here. So I'll try on a Saturday. So I spoke to this girl on the Saturday, told her the story. I said, I don't really want to go to court to get an order to um, produce a phone call. I said, you should be able to do that under the data subjects access request. Um, and she says, OK. She says, well, leave it with me and I will deal with it and I'll be call you back when I've done. Um, but what she told me on that call is that on the, on, the, on the bank computer screen, I'd been switched off of interest only and I was now on a £235 a month repayment mortgage and, and she said, that's where it's sitting. You're not even on interest only. I said, well, when did that happen? I said, because I'm sitting here still thinking I'm on interest only. And now you're telling me I'm on a repayment mortgage and it's at 235, which is different from the interest only price of 230. I said, so who's made this decision and why? I says, if they've done that, I says, I suspect that the man who was dealing with the claim for the bank has, re has, has listened to the phone call and has decided that I'm right and has tried to accommodate me in some way. I said, but I've had no notification of it. All I'm still getting told at this point is uh, these letters are coming through telling me that my rate's going to go up in a couple of months to 350-odd quid. So she says, well, leave it with me. I'll get back to you. So she went and did some digging. Four hours it took her. She called me back four hours later. And the first thing she said was, you were right. And I said, what? He's listened to the phone call. And she said, yep. Yeah. And I was like, brilliant. I said, so what's going on then? She says, well, I've been told to tell you it's going to be, uh, you're on £235 a month repayment and it will never go up. So I said, what? It's fixed. And that's it. To the end of time. Yeah, done. And I was like, brilliant. I said, that's good enough for me. I said, I could get on with life and try and focus on recovery rather than this war that was going on. Uh, brilliant. I'm happy with that. And I says, what happens if, I carry on getting these letters. She says, well, they were a banking error. You shouldn't have been getting them. I said, oh, OK. I said, so what happens if somebody overrules you? And she says, you've always got me um, and I'll try and put it right. So anyway, um, I thought, brilliant. So at this point, I had the property on the market. So I took it off the market. Uh, I thought I'll stay because that's affordable. I can manage that no matter what happens. Even if I lost all benefits, I could I could manage to find two hundred and thirty five pound a month, no problem. Um, so I felt safer. So ultimately, took it off the market. Uh, I was happy as Larry, doing a dance, thinking I'd, I'd dealt with it. And then two weeks later, another letter comes through the post. Your mortgage is due to go up to three hundred and fifty five pounds. And I was like, oh no. So I phoned up again. Spoke it, it, seem, it seems unrelenting. I mean, we're, we're talking about a time when, in your personal life, you're going through some difficulties. Um, you're having to battle uh, your, your own demons as well as this bank. And this bank it just seems un, unrelenting. Yeah, well, this is how it felt as well. It, it was like they're not going to give you a moment's peace. Um, uh, it, they're just purely... It, it's like I said, the gaslighting tactics that they use... Uh, are serious and and they've all they're all doing it um, nearly every company i deal with are, are, are exercising the same tactics um but ultimately um they started again so i thought right now i've got to get into it again and uh, another round of letters went flying out um asking them this and i've ended up in an argument with one of the, another manager who was saying she made a mistake and i said it's all right you saying that I said, but it affects my life, this mistake. I said, I, I took the property off my off the market. I said, I even sold my camper van before Christmas because I thought the mortgage was going to go up. And that I sold that for probably a £1,000 less than I could have got in the summer. I said, so ultimately, you're costing me money. These mistakes cost more than the £40 or £50 you're offering as compensation. I said, it's not good enough. Um, so we ended up in a battle with them and eventually got a deadlock letter out of it. Uh, then... I'd, in the meantime, that because I was in advances, but eventually they changed the mortgage to the higher rate, and within several months, oh, that's another thing they tried. They even tried, because I was £800 in advances, um, they tried to, to take the advances off the mortgage and send it me back. And I said, I don't want it back. I phoned them up and said, what are you giving me this £800 for? Oh, well, it, it's your advances. We thought you might want it back. I said, no. I says, what I want is to be ahead of the game on the mortgage. So you can't have a legal basis to try and repossess me. 
I said, that's what I want it there for. Not, not, <laughs> not to spend it. I just want it on the mortgage. So I had to fight with them to put the money back on the mortgage. Because <laughs> they were trying to manipulate a legal basis to get a repossession. Mm-hmm. And because of, because of me taking them to the ombudsman, when they're at the ombudsman, they can't go for repossession because the account's in dispute. Um, and But after the ombudsman, you then say, well, I'm going for legal advice now because I'm going to have to take you to court, which I'd already said to them. Um, so we're marching on now, and it's, it, it's, it's getting probably near 2013 when the girl had set the mortgage at 235, and it's just uh, midway through 2013 when I was being told, well, probably in March, actually, when I was being told, no, it's not going to... It, you, you're going to be paying this. So by the end of that that year, I was I was into arrears finally, and I'd even I, I tried to and, and all the way along. Now I'm just doing official offers. I, I can do no more than offer what I can comfortably afford to pay. And every now and again, you just write it out. This is my offer. Uh, I've I've set the the uh, standing order up to di- put this in. You're getting that off the DWP. That equates to this. That's my best offer and all I can manage right now. Send it to them. So they were accepting it, but not accepting it. On the one hand, they said taking your money, but on the other hand, they're harassing you through the uh, now through the collections department. Who at one point they I'd, I'd, they were calling me three times a day, um, morning, noon, and night, trying to get me to enter an arrangement with them. But every arrangement they offered, I said I can't afford. I said it's predictable, it's totally foreseeable that if I accept that offer, in a few months' time, I'm going to be out of money, bankrupt, and on the streets. I said, so I won't be set up to fail. So no, what you've got to do is take my offer. Um, and, and that's my best offer and that's what I can afford to pay. Oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll add interest and we'll do this and we'll send bailiffs round. And, and I said, I don't agree to any bailiffs coming round. Um, I said, if, if you come round, I'm going to report you to the FCA. Um, and basically, they sent a bailiff round. So he's come and what he's supposed to be doing is making an arrangement um, to uh, do a repayment plan with them. Like, I couldn't do it myself. I'd already done it uh, in paper. They just wanted to bully me with the fact that they could send a man round to my property. So I've opened the door. This guy's knocked. I've opened the door. Looked at, uh, he's holding his ID up. I've looked at his ID and then looked him in the face, then looked at his ID again, and his name on his ID weren't the same as the guy stood in front of me because I knew the bloke. <laughs> so I said... You're being used, mate. I says, that's not your name, is it? I says, you can't be producing false ID at uh, people's doors. And he went, no. Um, 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 so it's backing off down the, the hallway. And, and I said, no, don't let them use you on things like this, man. I says, you're just being used to try and intimidate me. He said, I oh, know. He says, report them to the FCA. And then left. And, and I thought, hmm, this is interesting. It's getting deeper now because this is like some sort of underhand espionage tactics where they send people round <laughs> you know what I mean it's like this is a new level of school duggery that I'd not not realized that they would do because they've got rules they've got the financial conduct authority rules that tell them what they can do but they don't follow them and it's no, like they, they, what what they've got is they've got the illusion of rules so that we think that there's rules that govern them but actually yeah, well, yeah. there isn't is there uh, that's 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 pretty much how I'd perceive it as well um because even though the rules are there, I think they take a gamble on whether we're going to know the rules or not. And if we don't know the rules, they can do what they want. Is basically, I think, what, how they play it. But on on the on the the other side of that is, is after he'd left, I wrote a complaint about that. Um, then they sent me a letter saying that they were going to take me to court. I said, you can't do that because we've not got the deadlock letter yet. I said, I, I wrote to your guy. Uh, last, he's yet to respond. I said, so the dispute's still ongoing. So the, once I spoke to them about this letter saying they were going to take me to court for possession, um, I phoned them up, and one of my arguments all the way through is, is, I don't think you can take me to court for several reasons, the main one being is you're capitalising the arrears. And I've been saying that since 2013, that that's a valid argument, because what the banks have been doing is they capitalise the arrears, which means they add it onto your mortgage, and once it's been capitalised on the mortgage, it's considered like they've paid themselves, because now it's spread across your payment plan over 25 years. So they've actually paid themselves, and as we found out by in 2014, um, there was a guy who used the same argument in Ireland, and 
he actually got a result, and it's called Bank of Scotland versus RIA. Um, on the Bank I just of spell Scotland, that. I just spell that for anybody who wanted to search that. Uh, Bank of Scotland versus REA. REA, okay. And basically, the the judgment was that they were reported for fraud, criminal fraud, by the Attorney General Q C Larkin in Ireland, and. He said that in, in the judgment, which I read feverishly, I couldn't wait to read it. As soon as I heard it had come out, I thought, thank God, because I'd been making that point to the bank all along, and they'd been threatening me with repossession when they'd been capitalising the arrears all along. So I, I basically said, uh, once I'd read it, I, I was sitting there thinking, brilliant, because what he said was that the bank are double-dipping, and they're trying to have their cake and eat it, and it, and it, and it can't be allowed to continue. So... He reported them for fraud. So now they're under a criminal investigation in Ireland, um, which really does have a ripple effect across the whole of the UK uh, for all of the banks concerned, because um, the same principle in action is the law over here. Because if you check the practice directions and the civil procedure rules, it tells you in the practice directions, um, I think it's... uh, Part 7, something like that, D7, in the practice directions for possession hearings. Part 32, is it? Anyway, um, what they tell you in there is that uh, capitalisation of the arrears is a, is one of the, the remedies that a bank can do to avoid repossession. So, thinking to myself, how they're still doing that over here. They're still uh, adding it to the, to the mortgage and then... St- trying to use the false arrears as a basis for a, a legal basis for a possession, um, which they can't do. Uh, it's illegal here as it is illegal in Ireland, but the only difference is, is that Ireland's got a judgment and we've not. We could use the principle of the case law and make the same argument, which I've done, uh, but because it's Irish case law, Northern Irish, it's not applicable in the UK. It's a one-way street. English case law or UK case law is applicable in Northern Ireland, but it doesn't come back the other way. Um, so what we can do yeah, is... Yeah, it's, it, it's a different, isn't it? Because when we, it, it's Great Britain, isn't it, that, that, that the laws apply to? Um, and um, Northern Ireland is in the UK. It's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So our yeah. laws affect them, but th- there are different laws in, in Northern Ireland. Yeah, this is this is the way it works. Yeah, um, I, I read that. There's a there's a good booklet out there on the web for people who want to learn it, and it's it's called the Queen's Bench Guide, and it's written by the judiciary, um, and that tells you in there that it's um, a one way street from Northern Ireland to it, 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 like like we just said, um, ours works for them, theirs won't necessarily work for us. Apart from the principle, the principle of any case, or if the circumstances are the same, even in, in American case law. Um, you could use the same argument over here and it, it could get the same result because if they've done the same mistakes in business, the judge will spot it and they'll award against them. Um, I've never had a problem with the judges in all my life, but up to now, um, it, it's it's one of them ones. I've always had a way about me when I go in there. I just try and go in there with the right attitude and point out the wrongdoings and, and well, moving ahead too far. But uh, so... Back to the mortgage, um, I was saying that you capitalization capitalising the arrears. She was saying, but we'll still come after you for, for the shortfall. Again, in, in their own financial conduct authority rules, uh, they're called the CONC rules, and there's another one for mortgage called the MCOB rules. Um, and it tells you in there that they can't do uh, what she's just said. They, they, they can't then make out that shortfall is different from arrears because arrears is shortfall and shortfall is arrears. But they try and separate the two. So they say, well, we can't come after you for the arrears, but we can come after you for the shortfall. No, you can't, but they do anyway. Uh, but <laughs> that's, that's basically the way they work. Uh, so ultimately, um, we moved on from there with the capitalisation of the arrears argument. When I knew that had come, uh, there'd been a judgment in Ireland, obviously I, I looked that up and I started adding it to my paperwork uh, because at this point, I'm also telling them, I said, look, you're not providing that phone call. I've now got to take you to court just to get an order to get that phone call off you that you're failing to provide. Um, I said, so that's what I'm working on. I said, and when I've done that, I'll start with the next bit, the, the contract that you failed to provide as well. Um, so they got really mardy. And the next thing I know is it was this was by October 2014. I've got the court paperwork. Um, and they'd put in 
for an application to repossess based on arrears. So I thought, cheeky bastards, I've got to respond to that now, because um, I was already making my paperwork for my own claim against them. They've tried to beat me to the punch because I told them they tried to beat me to it. Uh, because it's actually easier to go in as the claimant than it is to be the defendant. So I, I've suddenly thought, well, I've got my work cut out. I spent the weekend and I wrote a two page notice and I sent it into the courts and I waited. And the first thing that came back was an order from the courts, from a deputy judge, deputy district judge, saying it is ordered that the hearing will be relisted and the other one vacated uh, for a, a certain date. And then it said to in investigate the defendant's complaints against the claimant. So I thought, brilliant, I've done it, I've flipped it. Now, they're not going in for a hearing um, to repossess. Now, they're going in to be investigated. So I thought, cracked it, that's, that's a good move. Then... A couple of weeks after that, because I'd also said in my paperwork, I will be um, adding my evidence as I produce it. And basically what I was doing was going through all the files, finding every bit, of, every point that lent itself to me, every bit of wrong that they'd done me, every mistake they'd made I could focus on, um, all, all of the, the, the twisted stuff that they were writing. I was picking it out and saying, that, is this correct? Is that correct? So I've, I've basically started lobbing all this evidence bit by bit into the court and they were getting like two or three notices by this time and then I got another order come through saying this it said it is ordered that the claim is struck out and I was like cracked it I've got the bank struck out brilliant and I was having a party at that point um telling everybody in the groups and saying I think I've cracked it I could get them struck out only to be told two weeks after that another notice the, order, the previous order has been rescinded and the hearing is to go ahead as planned. Okay. How did that happen? Well, what happened was, was the bank, after they were struck out, fought back and pointed out to the judge that struck it out that the hearing that she struck it out on had already been vacated. And she ended up with both our paperwork in front of her, not realising that it had been vacated, looked at them and made the order... And I hadn't turned up. They hadn't turned up. Nobody had turned up because the hearing was vacated. So well, the bank just simply pointed out that it was vacated and you've made a mistake. So they had to undo it. So ultimately, the next thing that happened was uh, I was then panicking a little bit because I thought, God, this is going to happen. Um, I've got to get all my paperwork done now. I'd relax for two weeks because I thought I'd beat them. Uh, fortunately, I'd got a lot of my paperwork already done. Uh, but there was a, the pressure was on now because the hearing by this time is in two weeks' time. So I'm, I'm panicking, I'm spending all hours, God send, researching, writing, I'm editing my notices, I'm doing everything uh, to how I feel it should be done. And I've got no, no template of this. I'm, I'm having to do it out of my own head, if you like, because I've not seen anybody do it before. Um, not very few people actually beat them uh, and stop them at any, in any way. So... I'm having to wing it, if you like, just thinking this is how I think it should be done. I'm going to do it like that. So I, thought I ended up with a 47-page bundle that I filed two days before the hearing was due. And that night I heard uh, the day the court received the bundle, a rumour going around some of the chat rooms that the, the bank was pulling out of all litigations across the country. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if that's out to do with my bundle, because it is quite potent. Uh, there's quite a lot of law in there that they don't really want to uh, have made into law over here. Um, so the bundle was submitted, and I had to wait patiently, and the next day I got the letter through. Because we have realised that you are a vulnerable person, we are going to adjourn with an opportunity to restore. I thought, right, OK, not sure what that meant, but I thought it could be a trick because I've heard that they send people letters. It happened to one of my mates where they send you a letter. You think the, the hearing's postponed. You don't turn up and then they just go and get a summary judgment w without you being there. So I thought, no, I'm going to go down. So I've got my sports bag ready. I've got all my paperwork in two boxes, put it all in my sports bag. 
Um, and I've walked in there and got to be careful how I say this, but as I've walked in, the judge says, I don't know whether I dare call you Mr. Jarvu. And I said, please don't. I am here. And he said, no, no. He says, are you Mr. Jarvu? I said, I am here. I said, here, meet my mum, because I took my mum with me. Meet my mum. So he then got smiley with my mum and they all sort of sat down and then the solicitor gave him his paperwork and he's looking at it through his glasses and he says, yes, yes. He says, can you explain why you're applying for an adjournment with an opportunity to restore? And this solicitor said, I'm not too sure, but the client has just, the customer's just pointed out outside that it might be something to do with the Bank of Scotland versus Rear case. And I pulled it out. Uh, I'd got a print off of the article from the BBC website. I pulled it out, handed it to the judge. She's looked at it. And he said, yes, yes, quite. He says, I believe what this is about. And I says, they've been reported for fraud, basically, for double dipping. And he said, yes, yes, uh, yes, I think that's what this is about. And he handed it me back. And then he said to the solicitor, he says, you can have your opportunity to restore. He said, but if it's not brought back within a year, your claim will be struck out. Now, what I learned is that an, op an adjournment with an opportunity to restore can last for up to three years. So what he's basically told them is you're not kicking a can down the road for that long, you need to come in and face this. And then whilst I'm sitting there, he's done that, and I, I actually left. And I said, uh, excuse me, I said, can't we strike this claim out? I said, it's already been struck out once. I said, it's the same practice going on over here as it is in Ireland. I said, why can't we strike this out? Um, and he said, no, nope, no, nope, it wouldn't be appropriate. I quite get it at the time. And I thought, why is it not appropriate? And then I managed to ask him a load more questions and things like, does the signature create the money? I said, I've heard that the signature creates the money. Is that true? And he nodded. And I said, brilliant. Um, uh, there was other things, um, some of which escaped me right now. But I'd literally got a good 10 minutes of asking him questions. Oh, that was another one. I said, this power of attorney argument that people are using. I said, is it not true that if they've got a power of attorney, that they that must make the bank or imply that the bank are trustees? I says, is that right? And he nodded. I said, but how is it in my best interest? If they're trustees, I must be the beneficiary. How is it in my best interest to lose my home and my livelihood and everything I've worked for for 20 years? And he just sort of looked down at the desk and I was like, hmm. So I said, so we can't strike this out because it's not appropriate. And I said, and nothing I can say here is going to make you change your mind, is it? And he shook his head. He went, no. I said, because that's not my case, is it? That's their case. I says, all along, they've been trying to tell me that this is my case. I said, but it's not. It's their case, isn't it? And he nodded. I said, but my case is over there. And he kept trying to tell me. He kept touching my paperwork. He was going, I do see your point. I do see your point. And I, I said, which point? And he said, well... They did tell you in your affidavit that it was going to be under £235 a month and it was never going to go up because I transcripted. I got managed to get that telephone call and I had it transcripted, so it was all in the affidavit. Um, and, it, and he says, and my main point was, is that re despite them not having the contract, that's something they've not got. They've, they've got a false power of attorney. The deeds were not executed properly. Um, those... A contract breach when they failed their duty of care to put me on a correct product. I said, despite all of this, then they've told me that they were going to be at 2.35 a month and it would never go up and welched on that arrangement two weeks later. I said, so all of these things are leading towards contract breach. And he said, but there is still a contract breach because you're not paying the monthly payments. And I said, but they breached it first, did they not? And he said, yes, yes. I says, I think it's a bit rich, them holding me, to terms and conditions when they can't even prove that they hold the contract. And he laughed. He went, yes, quite, quite. Hmm. And, and, I, and I'm like thinking, I said, I'm going to have to insist that they produce this. He says, I've filed my court a record in there. And he was trying to gain joinder with me. He tried to call me Mr. Javu one more time. I said, please, I am here. Uh, and he said, yes, yes, quite. Then we got on first name terms and he was calling me by my first name. And it was... And I, and I was sitting there, 
um, asking him these questions. And eventually he said, I do see your point. And when I realised he, he see my point, when a judge says I see your point, it means he understands the point that you're making in law. Because he'd also said, he says, I can't forward your claims because you have no legal basis. And I didn't pick up on it at first. And then I said, legal? You said legal. And he smiled. It's like, oh, the penny's dropped, has it? Because I wrote a lawful claim. I put everything down as per the law, the co contract law, the common law. And I also used a little bit of statute, which is based on the Consumer Credit Act, about uh, unfair contracts and relationships, which the district judge has the power to quash any loan based on those grounds if he decides that an unfair relationship has developed. Um, so I'd read all this because I'd read the district judge handbook in conjunction with the Consumer Credit Act and several other documents, and I come up with that, and I thought, that's brilliant. So he can, he has got the power, so I felt like I had to tie all these arguments in to point out the unfair relationship that's developed. I said, they've not got this, that, 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 they've done wrong here, they've done me wrong there, they've cost, made a loss there, they've harmed me there. Um, this all conspires to an unfair treatment or an unfair contract. And I've since found out that uh, there's what's called a reverse burden on that. Uh, whereby once you've claimed unfair contract uh, has happened, it's up to them to prove that they've not treated you unfairly. And when I said that they've set me up to fail every step of the way, he actually said, I have no doubt about that in my mind at all. They were his exact words. So I said, at the end, I said, am I safe? And he said, yes. I said, excellent. I said, in that case, then, we agree. And I gave him joinder. Um, and then, in his order, it come, have, upon hearing the claimant and upon hearing uh, the defendant, it is ordered that uh, the, uh, the opportunity to the adjournment with opportunity to, to restore is uh, given. But if it's not brought back within a year and he gave a date, uh, it will be struck out. So, left there. And I, I looked back at the judge and he was about crying because I'd got him giggling at times and he'd got tears in his eyes. And I just said, thank you. Uh, gave him a little point, little thank you and walked out of there. All dead calm and nice. It, there was, he, he really did well to alleviate the tension that I was under. And I left there brimming. I thought, brilliant, I've cracked it. They, they, they can't do this. So I've gone a year helping other people with other things and mi getting mixed up, learning more stuff on different areas of the law. And then it got round to, uh, it was supposedly in December where the hearing was coming back. Two days before it was due to be struck out, they applied to have it relisted. So it was going to be relisted within the six weeks. Well, my parents were away. And the reason why they a little bit involved is because they've actually had to step in and pay off the arrears and I don't want them to really but as a last resort rather than lose your property um, so they were coming down with the checkbook and I'd been saying if you provide the evidence that the demonstrate that there's a loss according to generally accepted counting practices and principles demonstrate that you ho actually hold the contract uh, then and, and or demonstrate that you hold a deed of assignment then will pay the arrears. And I did that, and I sent it with a, from the Consumer Credit Act. You can do a, a Section 7779 request with a pound. You have to send a pound with it. And you send that, and they're supposed to send you what's called a true copy of the contract. So I sent that with a letter saying that we're going to pay, we'll offer to pay the arrears, providing you come up with this, this, and this. Um, and, again, that, this was all leading up to when they pulled out. So we've gone the whole year. They've then gone to bring it back. Uh, they tried to bring the hearing back when my parents were away. Um, so I wrote a notice to the court saying, uh, basically, my support network is not available to be there. If you want me there, can you push it back towards the end of March? So they relisted the hearing for the 1st of April this year. And before it come round again... I. I'd done a load more paperwork, and two days before, I filed a whole list of what's called CONC rule breaks. 
this is for debt collectors that um, they're supposed to follow the CONC rules. And they've got, in the Financial Conduct Authority website, they've actually got a, um, a, a set of principles. Well, there's 11 sorry, of them. Dave. So, sorry, Dave. Uh, what, what's CONC stand for? Um, to be honest, I can't remember. I was so used to saying the letter version. But the, okay. the, the MCOB is the Mortgage Code of Business Rules. Uh, the CONC, it escapes me right now, but, but um, these CONC rules, the, the Financial Conduct Authority has something called principles, and there's 11 of them. And really? by, the time, by the time I'd read them, I, I could honestly put to paper and say that I think that they've not complied with nine of them. Incredible. So, yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, Dave, listen... Um... We we are we've we've almost done an hour and then uh, I think what we do we we what we do normally do is uh, uh, have a little music break at this point, um, yeah. but it, it it's incredible that um, this story that you're telling us. I mean, you're this one person um, who's uh, suffering from um, health problems. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you, you're suffering from health problems and. These people have got an endless number of different people that will take it on and nobody will ever get bored of it because there's always somebody else to pass it on to. Whereas yeah. you've got to stay focused and uh, deal with the issues that, that, that this has undoubtedly brought upon your life um, that, you know, that's affecting you, uh, your health. And yet f for them, it, it just seems that it's a, a never-ending, relentless sort of... They've, they've got an endless supply of people that will just do what yeah. they do their bidding for them. Yeah, um, that's basically what you're up against. It's an entourage. It's like an, a, a, a going up against an army, and you're just one one man. I mean, if you look at the overriding principles in law, they've got something called the overriding objective, and it's all supposed to be fair. It's supposed to be on a level playing field and made fair. And one of the things I pointed out when I wrote my first notice, I, I focused a lot on the overriding objective. Without actually writing the words overriding objective, I was, I was making sure that I demonstrated in that notice that the principles of the overriding objective could not be adhered to. So, so I mean, the, what these people are doing is they're invoking these rules and they're not adhering to their own rules. So it, it's like they, they, the rules are there for you, but they're not there for them. Um, any, anyway, yeah, uh, I think I think what we should do is we should take a record so we can um, have a. And welcome back to Raconteur's News. Thanks for the intro there, Andrew. Um, absolutely fantastic Tuesday night. We've got a first time guest on. He's never been on the radio before. He told me he was a bag of nerves before he came on, but he's doing absolutely fabulously. Um, didn't hardly miss a beat there in the the first hour, Dave. Um, so. Would you like to carry on, or? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for the encouragement. Um, yeah, it's where we were left off. Is uh, earlier this year is the um, they set the hearing, another hearing for the first of April, and obviously, I filed more paperwork and I gave a list of these CONC rules, as I expressed before, uh, of these rule breaks that I believe they're broken, and I sent that in and. The next day, I got another letter from the, from the bank saying that we're going to adjourn with an opportunity to restore. So I thought, again, I'm not going to take them their word for it. I'm going to go down to the court and be there on the, uh, at the hearing day. So we turned up, and it was a really peculiar time to have a hearing because it, it, was, it was kind of the, the 1st of April, and there was nobody in the house. It, it was like there was no other hearings listed. There were things going on but it weren't even supposed to be for proper hearings, which I, I, I thought was a bit weird. And it was very empty when we went in there. But we ended up in front of this female judge this time. And this, by the way, is probably the fourth judge that's looked at this so far. And uh, whilst we were in there, um, she, she tried to say to me, uh, do you understand that this is for a very serious amount of arrears due to a mortgage, for a mortgage. And I said, I understand that I've got an order from a previous judge that is yet to be fulfilled for an investigation into my complaints against the bank. I said, I understand that, if that's what you mean. And she says, no, she says, do you understand that this is for a serious amount of arrears due for a mortgage? And she kept stressing the mortgage bit. And I was, like, a bit puzzled, because I actually thought 
she was being a bit condescending. Um, but then my mum piped up. She says, uh, you are aware that there's a dispute going on? And she nodded to my mum and, and, and I said, OK. And, and I said, well, again, second time, I said, well, all I'm here to do is to um, exercise this order and make sure I'm here to assist the court uh, with the order. And she says, well, that won't be happening today. She says it's adjourned with an opportunity to restore. And I said, oh, OK. Um, and there was a little bit of an interaction in between that, between me and the bank solicitor who tried to speak for me. She, at one point, the judge said, um, uh, she says, did you, did you get a letter? She says, we've received yours. Did you get ours? And I said, yeah, I got a letter yesterday telling me that they were going to try and adjourn it. I said, but I'm here, I'm ready. I said, so let's, let's do it. You know, and, it, and, it, and she was like, well... Uh, and then this solicitor said, he's had a letter. He got all irate. He, we sent him a letter. He's had it. He's had it. And I just looked at her and I held my arms out wide and said, did I not just say it that? I said, I'm not hiding anything, am I? And she smiled at me and glared at this solicitor. I'm not kidding you. If looks could kill, um, it have fell down on, the, on his seat. And he, he suddenly piped down and went all humble. Um, and then she said, well, it's not happening today. It's adjourned with an opportunity to restore. And I said, excellent. So he got up and left. I walked out and I said, thank you very much. And she was another one. She had a little wry smile on her face. And it just was enough to make me think. And, and I said to my mum as I walked out of there, I said, do you think she was being condescending then? She said, yeah. And I was like, I don't think she was. But in the same phrase, I feel like that, that solicitor made it feel that way with his attitude. Um, so I've got got out of there, and I was in a bit of a. Uh, uh, the the solicitor really rubbed me up the wrong way because the way he tried to speak for me, I thought, who the hell are you? Um, so it took me a while, and I, I kept thinking. I was like thinking, why the hell did she speak to me like that? Because I've never had a problem with a judge in my life. They've always been good as gold. So I've got on the internet and I started looking up. Um, uh, different rules and this, that, and the other, and then all of a sudden I thought, "Sod me!" I said, "She kept saying mortgage, and I've written a list of CONC rules which governs just their debt collecting department, and they've obviously got a list of MCOB rules, Mortgage Code of Business rules." And I suddenly thought, "That's it. That's what she was saying. Do a list of MCOB rule breaks, because I've only done the CONC rule breaks." So I went looking for MCOB rules, and I found this. A website called Nearly Legal, and it was written by a barrister. And this barrister on his website is explaining how he stops the banks repossessing his clients' homes. And he does it by producing a list of MCOB rule breaks at the hearing, at which point the bank solicitors take the list off him, adjourn, and then come back and make him an offer. So I thought, brilliant. And then there was another thing that I heard from a, a lady in Ireland who produced a list of 24. Same difference in Ireland. They've not got the MCOB rules, but they've got another version of them. A list of 24 rule breaks, and they adjourned from her hearing too and pulled out of there. Because when they adjourn, what they're doing is taking the case off the table. So it's not actually on the table. That's why when I was puzzling about why they couldn't strike it out, you can't strike something out that's not on the table. Because what they're doing, they adjourn it, they take the case off the table, there's nothing there to strike out. So they're then going back to the drawing board to try and find another avenue of attack uh, to try and get your property off you. So, so, it's, so it's like it's like uh, they're trying one thing and then with, when, when it, it's clear that that's not going to work, they're withdrawing that so that yeah. they don't get a judgment against them. And yeah. then trying something else. Yeah. Um, and so far, the, the, they've come back again. Um, they've basically pulled out. So now it's adjourned for another year. I got the order. Um, and it basically said, the possession here is adjourned generally with a liberty to restore and the to be struck out if no re request to restore is received by April the 1st, 2017. So ultimately... Uh, it's an April Fool's Day gag either way. <laughs> um, if they bring it back, maybe it's more for them because they what they need from what I've been told is they now need my permission um, to, uh, if you like, what do they call it? Uh, withdraw. It's not a withdraw. Um, oh, the word's gone. But there's a there's a term for it. They, they discontinue. That's the word. They can okay. continue. Yeah. Uh, but apparently they'd need my agreement to do that. 
I've just sort of thought... And the language as well is is interesting because discontinue means that it doesn't mean that it can't be continued at another time. It's not like it's withdrawn, is it? No, no, and it's not as the same as it's being struck out. It's them getting away with it. That's what it is. Um, And up to now, it's like my my original claim was that they were filing false claims in an order to uh, fabricate a legal basis um, to... uh, convince the court and I says basically they're attempting to the de- deceive the court um, they're trying to convince the court that they've got a legal basis when the only reason why we're in this position is because they won't do their work properly they, if they'd have done their job at any point in time all this could have been avoided um, and I did I did that was another thing I pushed across to the very first judge and, and he, he, he said he didn't doubt it so it, it begged the question as to why are they doing it and why are they getting away with it well I, I saw a uh, uh, an article several years ago uh, in one of the big newspapers written by a lord, and I, if I remember correctly, he was a law lord, and he actually said in there, in light of the uh, subprime derivative mortgage crash, or mortgage derivative crash, uh, the judiciary has been instructed to treat mortgages as the public perceive them. Well, if you have a think about it, the public perceive that they go in, borrow some money, and they're contractually bound to pay it back. And this is why 90% of all the people that have been going in there with different arguments about them not having a contract, they never loaned us any money, they didn't do this, they've not got a, a, a correct power of attorney deed, most of those arguments at some point or another have been bounced out the court because the judiciary has been instructed not to look at it that way. They've got to look at it in the traditional way that the public think of it. So they're going in with arguments that they can say are without merit because they've been told that this is the parameters you look through, look at mortgages at. That's what you've got to deal with, which when I realized that and I'd known it for a few years before it all happened, I knew that if I didn't find a way to uh, use a use a, a tool that the judge can react upon, which is the Consumer Credit Act is the tool. If I didn't find a way to tie it all into that, um, there's more case law. Uh, where for unfair treatment against the banks uh, than there is for any other thing that I can find. So I just thought if I can tie all this in, turn it around on them as I've been treated unfair, and their whole, literally their, all of their policies, the way they do business, leads to unfair treatment because they don't consider you at all. They, they've got no consequences for their own and it's all gain for them. And mm. all they're bothered about is gaslighting people into believing that they've got no rights and there's nothing they can do Um, and one of the things that I've discovered since it all I bought it earlier this year is there's a book called Fisher and Lightwood's Law on Mortgages and it's supposedly the book that they all follow or or supposed to follow where it comes down to the law on mortgages and on page 588 it says in there that they cannot take a property unless it's abandoned and that's paraphrasing it uh, quite a bit, and if they but if they do take a property and the property is not abandoned and there's people in the property, um, they could face criminal charges even for um, damaging what it's called is taking possession peaceably, and they could face criminal charges if they breach this law by forcing the locks, getting a locksmith to drill the locks, or pushing but- somebody out of the way. The, the problem is, Dave, is that is that it's OK for paedophiles to write that down on a piece of paper to give people some sort of um, feeling that, that, that they're protected in some way. But it's another uh, story when it, it comes into practice. Well, it does seem that way. And it's all boiling down to uh, the, the way that the, um, the parliament, the government, have set themselves up. I mean, there's, you can go right back to 2008 when I heard the Queen give a speech and she actually said, my government will do something about the repossessions. And it just got completely ignored. The upshot of that was there was something called the Carmel Butler Report done. And if you have never read it, you need to go and read it. It's on uh, legislation.gov website. And it was a team of 12 people that were all from different professions, solicitors, um, uh, reverends and all sorts of people, uh, basically all got together and were instructed to investigate everything that the government had done with regards to making it harder for the gang- the banks, the gangsters, to, to, to uh, take people's property off them. And the report condemns what the government done completely. It actually says that what they've done 
is made it easier for the banks. Everything they've implemented, this Tory government has implemented, has made it easier for these bankers to take even more properties. That's why we're on something like last year, 70,000 repossessions. And the reason why it was also found in the Carmel Butler report is that no bank had more than 3% capital. So when you're looking at that, by law, from what, what it said, is that they're supposed to have 50% capital by law. Yep. So what they've been doing for the last five or six years is creating these massive property portfolios uh, in, in the form of these um, asset management companies. And these will be owned by a bank. And normally when a property is repossessed, within three months, it should get released on the market through auction. But my hunch is this, and it is only, I only suspect this, I don't know this, uh, but my hunch is this, is that what they're doing to increase their capital value of the bank so they can start loaning more money again, they've set asset management company up, and the asset management company is buying up these properties cheap from the auction, then as soon as they're on the street value, maybe rented out or whatever, uh, they, they, put a, they get an estate agent's valuation, which will double. If you buy a property at auction and just put it straight on the market, you can usually mark it up for probably, if you bought one for 30 grand, you'd mark it up to 60 and it'd sell because it'd still be cheap compared to the rest of them that are on the market. Um, and you could do that at auctions if you had the money quite easily. I looked into it many times and it, it's something I think they've done is they've took all these properties in asset management company the, the bank owns that company, so therefore the collateral of that company belongs to the bank. And then the bank can turn around and say, well, now we have got 37% uh, collateral. That's raised from 3% to 30 And the reason why I know that figure is because when um, matey boy, what's his name, was born? Um, the, George. The tour of terror, yeah. Um, basically, when he, he got the boot and he left office, he had a speech. Now, you try and find his actual speech. I've searched it high and low. I can't find it. It's been sanitised off the net because in that speech, he, he boasted and he, he giggled and he said, he basically said, and the, and the, bank's, the bank's collateral is now at 37% nationwide. And he had a little wry smile on his face as if to say, we've done what we said we were going to do. And, and, and it's basically helped them become lawful. Because at the moment, every penny they're loaning, if they've not got 50% collateral, they're actually loaning unlawfully. Uh, well, uh, we've had a, a load of support for you, haven't we, in chat room? Um, and also, I've, I've had a message from my mate Heath, who, um, who always WhatsApps me when I'm, when I'm on radio. And he said, uh, amazing story, I would be f fucked and homeless with this onslaught. Luckily... He has the capacity of mind to self-educate and challenge them. Hope there is a happy end to this. So you're getting loads of support, and also uniquely in the chat room has also said that uh, the more onion, uh, the more layers of the onion you peel, the more it'll make you cry. Which I thought was yeah, uh, yeah very uh, apt, very because, apt. Yes, because it is, and and ultimately, this is what they've done. Is I mean, even the securitization of the. Uh, mortgages what they're doing is they sell them off if you watch a film called the big short i don't know if you've ever seen that um it explains this securitization of mortgages and how uh, the big scandal that led to the 2008 crash was all brought about by uh, the the brokers basically just going after signatures they were doing a signature harvest they didn't care what your earnings were what your job did uh, how how many properties you already had they just said we'll just keep remortgaging these people and, until uh, the bubble burst if you like well when the bubble burst it was the first time mortgage uh, products had ever become into scrutiny and they, there was people actually in America betting against the mortgages. And eventually, when it went, they made an awful lot of money. And it's explained all this in a major movie now. So it's even hard for these buggers to deny it ever happened because once people have watched that movie, it explains it perfectly. Um, and it's, it'd be, yeah, I recommend it to everybody who's interested in the subject. But they, they do, the, the deeper you get, once you're into these what they call SVPs, that's actually a trust. And one of the things that I did along the way was I sent the bank a revocation of power of attorney. And ultimately, uh, they tried to say to me that that doesn't, you, you can't do that until um, you've paid off the loan. And I said, well, that's interesting because there's a maxim in law that says uh, 
that nothing in law is irrevocable. I said, so therefore, it's revoked, and that is my intention. Well, turns out that at a similar time as to I sent that, the bank, in its witness statement, admits to uh, capitalising, uh, sorry, yes, securitising the mortgage in 2008, and then brought it back, bought it back in around 2012, which is about the same time as I sent a, a removal of power of attorney, a revocation of power of attorney document. So people say these things don't have any effect. I think they do. Another thing that um, seemed to have an effect was a removal of rights of implied access. And I, I sent that to one to, to the bank, and they sent the, the account to another bank, the sister bank. And I phoned up the sister bank. I said, why am I getting letters from you. You're not my bank. And they said, oh, well, we've, the account's been passed to us because there's a complaint on it. Says so that's never happened with any other complaint. So I sent them a revocation of power of attorney. And they, uh, it's not a power of attorney, a removal of rights of implied access. And then all of a sudden it was bounced to the debt collecting side of the original bank, who happens to be a, a separate company, a separate corporation, a third party, again. So they sent it to another, so I sent them one. And then it ended up back at the original bank, and it just went silent for ages. So the, these things, even though a lot of people out there on the internet are saying that don't work, this don't work, they definitely have an effect. Um, because I've noticed that they, they were treating the account like a hot potato. And eventually it settled with the solicitor, and uh, their solicitor, and I said, I'll deal with you. So I'm not dealing with any of them uh, because I can't have a rational conversation. They gaslight you. Um, they take the absolute piss when they're talking to you. And another thing uh, that I can't really tell you that because it, it identifies who they are too easily. Um, but there's there's so many things that I could uh, pull out the hat. But anyway, back to the original story is um, coming up to April the 1st this year. Went in, we had that meeting. So now we're on an adjournment um, with an opportunity to restore. And they then started sending me, I sent an official offer to match the offer that they said that they would stick to in 2013, the £235 a month, and they rejected it. So the letter didn't do much else. There were two pages, but all it said is that that offer's rejected and this is the statement of account so far. So then a few weeks later, they sent me letters saying that now they want to add the... Uh, costs of their solicitor's costs <laughs> onto my mortgage um, to the tune of about three grand. For, I, I sent a letter saying, look, now I feel like I'm being forced uh, by your, 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 your unnecessary litigation. and Because, again, in the uh, Fisher and Lightwood's Law of Mortgages, it says in there that if, if a litigation is unnecessary, improper, and there's another word, um, but basically, if, if it's any of them things, they're not allowed to charge the customer for the litigation costs. So I've told them, I said, you know it's improper, you shouldn't have filed the claim, but you're still now trying to put this on me. So my latest letter was basically one saying that I'm going to put the property on the market because what I've noticed is things are starting to sell again. I've seen loads of sale boards go up, and I might be able to walk out of this with some equity uh, in my pocket. And then, maybe, if I'm still up for it, I can go and challenge the bank when they've got no leverage over me. Because it's a hell of a pressure. That to... sounds like a smart move, Dave, yeah. Um, um, we, we've so... got quite a lot of response from the chat room. Uh, most of it supportive comments. Uh, well, all of it supportive comments. There has... Usually we get somebody picking fault in what the guest is saying but with you um we, we haven't had any of that we have had a couple of questions one's from unique lee and he's asking has your guest attempted to use the simon spaniard method and start charging for the time and energy writing letters you already asked that question under no we did, i think we're off air weren't we no i asked that one oh, was off air sorry yeah, writing no, letters sorry, and I'm notices <laughs> Sorry, go on, carry on. Letters and notices as this company keeps sending alterations to set agreements and one doesn't need permission to charge for time spent reply, replying when the company compels a response. Yeah, well, um, 
yes, I know about Cy Spaniard's methods. I'm, I'm fully versed with uh, the way he does things. I did send a fee schedule um, in the early days, but I, I've always of the understanding that if I get a result and get a judgment against them, then will be the time to calculate my fee schedule because then I can prove categorically that it was time spent above and beyond the call of duty of any contract that I could have ever been in. So um, that would be on the horizon if I get the judgment and it ends up uh, having to go back to the courts and the courts rule in my favour, um, then... Which could happen, because he's got the grounds to do it, the judge has, under the Consumer Credit Act. Uh, but it, it's, again, it's, ask, it's for a big ask. Um, I, I kind of expect it to happen, because I think I'm right. But I know so many other people who've been in the same boat who probably were right that have been shafted. I don't, I don't want to get too cocky, you know. But um, So, yes, I do, to his question, yes, I do. Uh, I probably will send him an invoice at some point. I've just not done it yet. OK, excellent. Thanks for that, Dave. It's clearly thought that through and, and looked at that option. Uh, Lee's also given us a quote he'd like to read and ask for your reaction. Uh, it's a quote. I'm not quite sure where the quote comes from because there's people being posting links in the chat room so damn fast it's unreal. We've even got a video that Guy Taylor's sent in um, which is relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Um, the quote is, the money placed in custody of a banker is to all intent and purposes the money of the banker to do with as he pleases. He is guilty of no breach of trust in employing it. He is not answerable to the principal if he puts it into jeopardy. If he engages in hazardous speculation, he is not bound to keep it or deal with it as the property of his principal, but he is, of course, answerable for the amount because he has contracted, having received that money, to repay the principal when demanded. And Lee's uh, basically asking, can you ask the guest what he thinks about that quote I just posted and how this affects the perspective of what we're all doing when we create credit or deposit stroke gift it all away? Um, well, I find that a, a fairly long-winded question. Um, and I can't see it to, to refresh over it. But ultimately, um, I wouldn't take much notice in any of their rules because you've got to, for me, if they breach contract, um, that takes it into common law anyway, uh, English common law, uh, sorry, English contract law. So uh, under English contract law, when you've got a breach of contract, uh, they're going to struggle to... Uh, quote some legal ease and, and say it overrules the contract law if they've already breached the contract law. Um, I'm not too sure what he means uh, by the whole question and what he's after, but um, I don't let any of that stuff get in my way because I know law trumps legal and you're using the law, uh, then I, all I ever do is, is point out um, it, it's point out using their words and their acts and their statutes what they're doing wrong where if they broke something i'll point it out but it's never the basis of my claim it's just pointing out that here's the rules that broke it here's the rules you broke it because under contract law you've got a right to be treated in a professional and ethical manner and if they're not treated you as a professional with a professional and ethical manner you've got a right to terminate that contract um and there's a process for that as well, accepting the breach and termination of breach. Uh, it's something I've not done yet. Might do it, um, but ultimately I'd like to let the judge decide. But, uh, yeah, so I don't, I won't get, what my answer is, is I won't get caught up in all of that. When they say that it's, it's their money and this, that and the other, nobody in the public perceives it. If you put money in the bank and you had a jury and you said, right, you've got £5,000 in the bank, whose is it? Is it yours or is it the bank's? Every that common law jury would say it's theirs because they believe it's theirs. Mm. And so therefore, you'd win in a jury trial on that argument because the public could perceive it as their own because they don't think that they're giving their money away to the bank. Um, so therefore, common law would reign supreme. Um, and they, what they're trying to do is go into equity all the time, you see, because they've not got the contract. So basically when they've not got that contract, they'll try and uh, say that there's an equitable contract. And it's called a confessionary judgment. And 
the confession is the fact that you've been paying it and they can prove that you've been paying it. But what they don't really like to know is that even that's a double edged because it could, you could actually turn it around and say, well, considering you have agreed, you've admitted that you weren't holding the contract between 2008 and, and 2012, there's proof there that you've been taking money off me for the last four years unlawfully because you never held the contract. So they could go for this equitable contract on that grounds if they want. But another thing as well with equity is they have to have clean hands. And if they've not got clean hands, uh, then they can't stand in equity. And I think if you read the Carmel Butler report, if that doesn't prove that they've not got clean hands, i.e. they've not been operating as per the law says, not even their own rules, they're not even operating as per their own rules, um, then basically they're not operating with clean hands. So they can't actually go into equity, even though that's probably how most of the repossessions are done. They're using the common law for a contract breach because people, break the payments and this is what I would say um, I've only done all of this at a necessity um, I've been put in this position I've had to fight my back's been to the wall and I've had to fight and I've had to dig deep learn things that I never really thought I ever needed to know uh, to know and ultimately um, so far touch wood it served me well I'm still here uh, they've not got the mitts on it they can't seem to get an order because to do that they've got to face an investigation so um, yeah, it's it, it, anyway. Next question. I'm rambling. Andy, you need to turn your mic on, mate. Yeah, no, that's not a problem. You, um, rambling's not a problem. Uh, I think we're out of questions right now. Right. Well, well, we're not really out of questions. Well, we're, we're out of talking. questions from the chat room. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, this. Let's go back to when this first started. After after what you've been through and all the problems that you've been through, would you, going back to the beginning, would you do the same again? Or, or what would you change? Um, well, to be honest, it's like I said, necessity. Uh, operated out of necessity. Necessity makes the law. It's important in, in law, that word, necessity. Yeah. Um, and all I've had to do is operate out of necessity every step of the way. Um, I've had to make official offers because I had to take control of the account because if, if they'd have been in control of the account, they'd have put me in a position where I was, I'd have had no money left, not been able to feed myself, not been able to put the heating on. I wouldn't have had electricity. I'd have had no broadband to do anything. Um, if they'd have had their way, and this is what you've got to recognise, when they're doing that, if you could calculate in your mind that uh, in several months' time all your money's going to be gone, then that's called it's it's foreseeable because you can see a point where you, your money's going to disappear and you can't support yourself. Uh -huh. So that, when you say it's totally foreseeable that that can happen and it's totally foreseeable that if I end up homeless and on the streets that I might end up dead because the statistics on deaths of homeless people, it's a lot harder if you're homeless, you're more likely to die than if you're in a home. So there's actually a claim there uh, for being under a level of duress and, and, and being, if you like, they, want, they, they could be attempting to murder you. Um, it, it's as, it sounds dramatic, but that's what happens. People end up on the streets and they die. And that's avoidable death because all they needed to do was say, all right, then we'll, we'll accept the £200. And, and yet what they're doing is trying to ignore you, steamroller over you, abuse the court process to their own advantage and steal as many properties as they can, and they'll say it's lawful and they've got the absolute right to do it. But um, ultimately, yeah, it's... Uh, we, we've got a right to it's fight. It's morally them. wrong, isn't it? It's morally it is. wrong to throw somebody out of the house basically on a technicality yeah. when really what you've done is uh, you've ganged up. You as an organisation have ganged up on an individual who you have got documented... Do Sorry, documentary evidence that this individual is is suffering. Um, uh, it, it's it's corporate bullying, and and that and that's what's going on in all walks of life. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it, it is, and it's in nearly every firm I deal with are, 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 are practicing the same tactics. Yeah. They took it. They took it from the neuro linguistics when when they uh, the psychologists 
at the neurolinguistic programmers got to marry into in, got together in America. They designed a form of program, and in every letter they used neurolinguistic programming on it, and it's all designed to get you to react in a certain way. Um, every time you talk to somebody, the, the member of staff, they're programmed with this language, yep. and and they're taught to get a yes out of you if you if you're selling, and they use hot marketing. And, and they're taught to get a yes out of you. When it comes up to phoning up and cancelling the contract, then they have another group that's uh, trained in what I call cold marketing. And these buggers are there to put you off. They will offer you the earth and the moon and the sun to stop you from uh, cancelling that contract. Because the fewer contracts, it damages the shareholders. And it seems to me like the important players, the ones that are always forgotten about, are the shareholders. They're the ones who are watching the, um, if you like, the, the management of banks commit uh, fraud in a lot of cases. And I don't use that word lightly. They know that they're ripping people off. But they also know, through, through uh, articles like the same as I read, that they're going to get a bit of a blind eye turn to their misbehaviour because the judges and the judiciary have been instructed to uh, treat uh, mortgages how the public perceive them. Not only that, is they've created a situation in, uh, nationally where they've limited the amount of legal aid which will naturally uh, uh, make sure there's more litigants in person and people representing themselves. And then at the same time, they've done a hatchet job on anybody who's considered a litigant in person is, is considered a group labelled free man on the land. And they've done a, a sterling job of making sure that every company, solicitor company and judiciary in the country has got um, a, 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 a label for anybody representing themselves. So ultimately, um, they, they'd like saying, well, he's a, you're a free man on the land and you're this and you're that and you're not respectable and we've got privilege behind us. What we say goes as far as the judges are concerned and we know that you've not got the skills legally because it takes a solicitor seven years to train for those skills, and we know that legally you've not got the skills to fight us back. So yeah. it's like walking up to somebody, picking a fight when you're armed to the teeth and the guy's wounded on the floor already, are begging for his life, and, they, and, he, and, he, and basically they're just walking over, finishing him off. But, yeah. well, Dave, <laughs> do, you, do you think that... Um, now, we're talking about... Uh, they're trying to steal your house off you. They're trying to get you out of there. Mm. Um, and so what they've basically done is they're trying to uh, uh, stuff you up the grot box. And then, do you think that what's hap what, what they're doing has invoked some uh, payment on it, any insurance schemes that they may have got in place upon your mortgage? Yeah, and well, do you, do you think, they, they think they've got that already, uh, and, yeah. and perhaps uh, they, they, they're doing it again. I actually brought that up um, in the 2014 hearing and, and I, I said even the indemnity policy, I said the way I understand it, after three months of non-payments non or getting three months behind, they can claim off their indemnity insurance and I said I'd like to know if they have been claimed and this is actually a double dip again because it seems to me like they get paid off their indemnity, they've had all the money I've paid them, they get, they've had the promissory note that you give them They've had the money that you pay them. They get the indemnity if you default. Then they come after you for the shortfall once they've sold the property. And they've had the securitization money. And the fresh of the original note. Yeah, it is a massive scam, isn't it, Dave? It's unbelievable. I don't know how anybody can stick up for them. There's, I know there's a lot of people out there that seem to call us blind for wanting to sort of keep our property. With You know, it... it it just defies all logic. If you've worked for Summit most of your life and your, your, your life's work has been put into a property, why should you give it up? Because they have had a, a, a brain fart on the stock market and lost all our money. And now they expect us to re reimburse them. When it, they, They're the ones that messed it up. It wasn't none of us. It yeah. drives me crazy. Um, and what, I see the injustice in it. And it's the injustice that keeps me going. Um, it's knowing that if, if you could help one more person stop the buggers stealing their property, um, it would be all worthwhile. That's why I, I felt like I needed to come and speak my piece on, on the radio. Um, nope. just, just to say that don't give up. 
um, if, you, if you document everything and record all the phone calls, get a device to record every goddamn call because they won't give you the calls if they incriminate themselves. Don't tell them you're recording them. Let them be as obnoxious as they can be. They, use, they, they, they laugh at you. Um, they, they, they think that you're talking nonsense when you're quoting their own rules to them. Um, they can be really obnoxious. Some of the stuff, really nice. I never had problems with some of them, but there was a few of them that were damn right obnoxious and rude and, and threatening at times, you know, using the legal of bailiffs and courts like a hammer. Yeah. You pay us or else. You pay us or else. It's the, it, it, and it's like, well, that's not what they're for. They're supposed to be used as a last resort. And if I'm not refusing to pay, which I never have, I've always maintained the payment, why the hell are they even getting in the courts? Because the, the law is, is that they have to accept your offer. Um, and it's so long as you're not refusing to pay. That's what usually causes the problem. And th it's like I said with the judge, even with the official offer, you are breaching contracts. And I want people to understand this because that's what the judge said. He says, even though when you're not making the alleged contractual payments, you are breaching the contract when you use the official offer process. But I use it anyway because it's like somebody in the chat room last time I was in your uh, radio show quite rightly said that it's like a sticking plaster. It, it, it just uh, patches up the hole to stop the water coming out faster, uh, the water being currency, <laughs> money. Um, so ultimately, you're not incurring as many costs. You still end up incurring high interest charges. Uh, they're trying, like I said, they've already trying to give us uh, solicitor's costs. Before they've had a decision, they've not had a verdict or anything like that. No. They just think they've got the right to do it because it says in their rules that they can, but it also says in their rules that they have to be necessary. And one of the things um, about Civil Procedure Rule 5.2, you can, you can look at that and it will tell you that they're not supposed to file what's called a PCOL, uh, a PCOL claim, PCOL, possession claim online, uh, against anybody that's considered vulnerable. Yes. And yet they're doing it. And yep. then they'll use the, oh, well, now we've realised you're vulnerable, we're, we're going to adjourn. Um, uh, we, uh, yeah, we're, we're adjourning because we've realised that you're vulnerable. Not because you've put a 47-page bundle in with an affidavit that's going to fuck your day up, because you're vulnerable. So uh, <laughs> yeah. they, they want it all ways. They want to try and save face. Um, and they, this is that's what it's all about, liability shifting and face-saving manoeuvres. That's yep. basically what the game is. I'm I'm so glad that you made that decision that you wanted to talk about that on the radio and called me, Dave. And I must say, when you called me that night after the Anthony Carlin show, I was absolutely blown away by your, your depth and breadth of knowledge and uh, how you handle yourself in the court system. And I thought, yep, yeah, we need this guy on the air. Well, li little known to me at that time, uh, you got in touch with Tony Hurst, uh, Tony's working away behind the scenes he's our webmaster he comes in sits in on shows sometimes as well he does some music shows does some fantastic work but tony um spotted something or well, worked something out that i didn't and he um he asked you about coming on and doing your own show in the future and i understand that's something you'd be up for doing yeah definitely um I've, law's been like a hobby to me for a long time so i love talking about it I love trying to help people through and point them in the right direction. And if I could get uh, to the point where I'm doing it once a week, and I'm going to try and get a lot of people on that, are, that, that actually get results caught and, and beat them, and we'll have other, hopefully have other stories where people are ongoing with it. So if we can give assistance and support, then we can. Um, that, that's something I'm definitely up for doing, um, and hopefully it'll be on a Wednesday night. So, Andy, this has been a... a, a, a two-hour job interview for Dave then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm not doing it for money. I'm doing it for love. Oh, don't, no, you don't get paid. It's a good job you're not doing it for money, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's no money in this. And, the, and this, is, this is the thing. I mean, I've had my week upset this week because I've had the uh, DWP uh, suddenly hit me with, um, what's it called? Uh, oh, crikey, I've got to find the letter now. It's... It's a notification of local service compliance telephone interview. 
um, which basically means that somebody's tried to uh, grasp me up for something that they think I've done, and now I've got to prove my innocence. So that's going to be another venture. But again, when you're in these circles, there's so many people that have already dealt with these things. You can get like um, a head start uh, because they're all in different groups talking different things. I'm in groups on Facebook that deal with benefits, uh, groups that deal with bailiff, groups that deal with banks, groups that there's a group for everything. So there's always somebody who's, who's got the head around something and knows how you should handle it. And that, that gives you a valuable head start, doesn't it? If you were just, when I was on my own, when I first started, and I didn't know anybody in any of these groups, I didn't even know them groups existed. I'd never heard of Side Spaniard. Um, um, I'd, I'd never even heard of John Harris until I found him on the net. Um, and he, he, he seemed to be like the forerunner of all, all, all of the people getting into law and trying to understand the name and the legal fiction and the person and all of that. I'd never heard of any of them people till I got on the net. But once I realised they were in existence and there's so many people interested in the topic, albeit it's not the most popular topic on the planet, but there's still enough people and there's a void, isn't there? There's the, 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 the system's giving us nothing. No help, no, no solicitors, no legal aid. So no, and us. that's what you need to do as well, Dave. And I, I've got to admire you because I studied law um, back in 1997. I had my first heart attack. I was 27 years old, uh, and while I was while I was recuperating, I decided to take law. Decided to study law, and um, I ended up being one of only two people that got a, an A level at Rother Valley College in Dinnington for law in like the whole time it had been open. So. Um, so I, I, I completely understand that, that where you're coming from is, is that it, once you get into it, it becomes so interesting because it, 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 it divulges into it, it tan, tangents into different areas and yeah, definitely. you, know, you learn never, some Latin and you and you you know you learn some all sorts of different things. I never thought I'd end up owning a Bible. And that's one of the things that uh, so no matter which which area of law you look at. Um, there's always somebody um, requoting somewhere. It, it leads back to the Bible. And I never thought I'd end up owning one. I, I've actually got one now because I refer to it. And all of the stories um, in the Bible, the, the, he, this thing I often say to people is that you can claim your own estate. Uh, you've got to operate in the system as a man. You've got to be respectable. It's like boils down to the Bible stories um, where you had a, a character called Jesus and a character called Barabbas. And Barabbas was a rebel rouser. And if you go into their is world... He, is he the guy out of the A-team that w wouldn't get on the place? <laughs> the <A> Barabbas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. But basically, Barabbas, he, he was the rebel rouser and the Romans wanted to kill him, but they ended up in the story having to kill Jesus instead because the crowd bade for Barabbas to be released. Um, well, the thing is, is that if you go in there as a rebel rouser, they're going to dish, dish out some rough justice. Um, but if you go in there with the dignity, respect, understanding, the learning capabilities, because most people don't listen. When I, I had it the other week where somebody had, had, a, had an incident with the judge. They were trying to get some documents, and the judge was saying to them, I can't do anything unless it's in front of me. I can't do anything unless it's in front of me. And, and I was speaking to him several days later. I said, have you sent it yet? No, no, well, she couldn't do anything. I said, dude, send it. Fax it straight the way. I said, you've got to get that document over to her. The reason why you've not had anything from them is because she's waiting for it. You're telling them you've got some evidence. She needs to see it, get it there. But because they'd fobbed them off on the phone saying she couldn't do anything, I said she was actually telling you that she needed it in front of her. That's the bit you should have been listening to. Send it. So I've not heard yet whether it's been accepted because he sent it late and, or it's all been railroaded over. But it, if he'd have listened and heard that one little bit, that he needed to is that if it's in front of her, she can't. She can deal with it because she, what she was saying, she can't deal with it because it's not in front of her. So, it just. I said, why didn't he send it? I didn't really think. I thought she'd dealt with. No, nope, send it. So I'm hoping that that's going to come out well for him because it was an evidence thing um, that meant that the other side were going to get a judgment if they didn't see this document. But they could only get the document uh, on the day. So, but this is the thing. You've got to listen to them. They speak in a certain way. Uh, they use words um, in, in, in a fashion. We know that they speak legalese, um, but they also use some etymology in words as well. We wouldn't really get our heads round until we've 
looked at the meanings of words through etymology, what they actually mean. Um, most of it, it's like the word child. Um, you can go in uh, and say that that's my child, and what you're actually saying, and it tells you this in the Osborne's Law Dictionary, that the word child, uh, for, the, for the part of the uh, child, child Act, means a young offender under the age of 14. It looks to me like it's actually saying, if you went into a court and said, yes, that's my child, you've just admitted to them being a young offender under the age of 14. And that gives them jurisdiction to tell you what you can do with your kids. And another thing I'd like to say is that years ago, I helped a girl, uh, trained her in about 10 minutes. She had a social services coming after her kid. And she showed me the letter. She was heartbroken because she didn't want me to read the letter because it was five pages of how much of a bitch she was. And the ultimate part of it is I read it all through and right at the bottom of the letter, you get this um, signature bar where they wanted her to sign this letter and the very last line underneath the signature and it said that all this is happening as per your wishes. I says, is this happening as per your wishes? She says, no, it's not. And I says, well, that's what you say then. So when you go back and they have you back for the interview, you chuck this on the table, you push it back to them, and you say, that is not per my wishes. And she says, well, that do. I said, yeah, I'm telling you, they need your signature before they can take your kid. So basically what happened was she went there, four of them tried to peer pressure her for an hour to try and get her to sign it. She just sat there with her arms folded and said, that is not per my wishes, and said nothing else. She just kept repeating it. And ultimately, they let her out of there. She, they never took her kid. They couldn't get her kid off her because she hadn't given them the permission to take it. And that's what you've got to look out for. When you're looking, reading any letters, they write a, a letter that if you were reading it and it was about you, you'd be heartbroken. And these girls are heartbroken when they get these letters. They just think, oh, God, they think this and that. And their brain just caves in to a quiver and they sign it. And that is how they're getting joined to steal people's kids, unless... Um, unless you, you've broke the law and caused an injury, a harm or a loss. Uh, but most of the time, when that's not happened and they're getting their nose in, it's all down to signing something. And s they usually focus on the woman, get them to sign, and it will be as per her wishes. And that's how they steal kids. So uh, just something I thought was important we could chuck in on the end here to take us to the last five minutes. That's absolutely fabulous work, Dave. And I, I, I get a feeling that uh, you're going to become a bit of a go-to man on Raconteurs News, and uh, I think you'll you'll get a, a lot of listeners and uh, a lot of support. So, yeah. well, really... I have, I've got a page, if you don't mind me saying it, on Facebook called "It's the Law." If people want to go and like that page, mm -hmm. um, then I'm usually not too far away from it. Yeah, I'll put the links to that in the um, in the show notes when we write up the podcast. And uh, I've also had a load of links posted in the chat room. I'll include as many of them as we can, which uh, illustrate some of the points you are making, and um, particularly with the uh, the Ray case in in Ireland as well. So yeah. thanks ever so much for coming on, Dave. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and uh, really looking forward to getting you up and running with your own show. So Yeah, yeah, what... yeah. sorry, I, I'm looking forward to Dave's show as well. Um, I, I love listening to other shows. I, I know I don't actually appear in chat box or anything, but you know, I was listening yeah. to you uniquely last night and everything. And um, it, yeah. I, I love listening to him. Dave sounds like he's going to have some great shows. So, uh, yeah, welcome yeah. to Raconteurs News, I think. Yeah, Thank you welcome very much, aboard, fellas. Dave. Appreciate that. And uh, yeah, all that remains for me is to just say um, there's nobody on Wednesday night on the schedule this week, but Doctor Rock will be back Thursday night. I don't know what Doc's got planned this week, but really looking forward to it. And uh, just keep watching the Wednesday night slot for Dave. We'll be back next Tuesday at eight pm, the usual time. And we've got somebody a bit different this time. We've got a Brummy from Texas. Uh, we'll be joined next Tuesday by Nick Redfern, who's wrote I don't know how many books on all kinds of subjects to do with ufology and visitors from other planets. 